My name is Brian Canlis. I'm the third generation owner of a restaurant in Seattle uh, called Canlis. Um, and I'm here to introduce the next speaker. I do not know the next speaker. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never been to his famed uh, restaurant in Australia. Uh, I've never even been to Australia. Um, when Will uh, asked me, in fact, so you know, last year I traveled 3,000 miles uh, to come give a speech on this stage. Actually, it was a much smaller stage last year. Um, but uh, because I had something to say about hospitality. And when Will said, hey, we want you to do an introduction to the next Welcome Conference, um, he showed me the list of all the names. And one name stood out to me, Banjo Harris Plain. What inspires a guy to travel 10,000 miles to give a 15-minute speech? Um, I started obsessing about this guy. I was like, who, you, I mean, you, you can ask my wife. One night, I was actually laying in bed staring at the ceiling. Um, and she's like, what are you doing? And I said, who is Banjo Harris Plain? <laughs> um, so I did what most people do. I started stalking him on the internet. Um, and you can learn a lot from the internet. Um, <laughs> I learned he's named after a famous Australian poet named Banjo Patterson, that in his room is actually a, a Banjo's original wardrobe etched with Banjo's name, um, which is really cool. He wrote The Man from Snowy River, uh, which is pretty fun. I, I learned, yeah, he's worked at the best restaurants all across Australia. Um, he's a famed sommelier. His current restaurant is one of the, renowned is one of the best in the entire world, Attica. Um, I even learned that he has an weirdly disproportionate amount of mustard in his fridge. That's like on page two of the Google results. Um, but you know, you can only learn uh, so much from the internet, as any of you who have internet dated before. Um, <laughs> it, 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 it leaves you wanting so much. And last night, I had the privilege of sharing a bowl of noodles with Banjo Harris Plain. And uh, the first thing I noticed was that he is far better looking than his profile photo, which never happens. Um, but before long, I learned um, what I was hoping to learn, uh, is this is a guy with a huge heart for hospitality. Um, he has this glowing ember uh, inside of him that needs to be shared. Uh, it is a message worth traveling halfway around the world to deliver to you. And so it is with great honor that I welcome my new friend, <laughs> Banjo Harris Plain. <laughs> kills me, without kills purpose, me. we would not exist. It is purpose that created us, purpose that connects us, purpose that pulls us, that guides us, that drives us. It is purpose that defines It is purpose that defines us. Thank you to the uh, Wachowski siblings and to Hugo Weaving, a fellow Australian. Um, without purpose, we would not exist. Richard Betts, the former speaker, I thought, delivered it beautifully when he referred to uh, the sense of what you need to do every day as, as your oxygen. This is uh, at the heart of what I want to talk about. Purpose is your inner sense of what to do in, in really any situation, whether it be uh, the day-to-day the -day of our hospitality life or indeed in any other situation that we find ourselves faced with. It's not uh, necessarily the cosmic, karmic, what is the meaning of life, but looking within yourself, you find what you need to do. Uh, like I said, the oxygen that you, you need to find for yourself. And this is uh, easy to, to maybe vocalize and for me to say, look deep within yourself, find what you need to do. But to actually discover that and find it uh, is perhaps more difficult. Once you've found it, however, I can assure you it's impossible to lose. This sense of purpose will drive almost any action that you have. I work in a small restaurant in the south of Melbourne called Attica. 
uh, I suspect that many people in this room have not been there. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. It's, uh, it's been there for just under 10 years, and I've been there for, for nearly half of that time. Um, we only open for dinner. Uh, we only open five nights a week, and we only seat 55 people. And when I started working there, I was one of six front of house members. My day would start at about nine o'clock, and I would be the head of reservations for that day. At about three o'clock, I would become the floor supervisor. At about five o'clock, I finally became the restaurant manager before realizing that I was also meant to be the head sommelier. This lasted for about a year, uh, during which time the restaurant underwent some changes, and thankfully, we started to receive a lot of really beautiful press, both locally and internationally. Uh, and today, whilst we're certainly a more successful restaurant, I wouldn't say we're necessarily a much, much larger restaurant. We're still an incredibly tight, small team. Uh, and what's helped us to get to where we are today and hopefully push forward is the sense of purpose that I and the entire team at Attica have and the sense of conviction that we have which enables us to carry out that purpose. I believe, and I've only, to be honest with you, I reckon I've only really been able to put what Attica's purpose is into words since I was invited to talk here. I think I knew it subconsciously. I think my actions were defined by these thoughts, but being asked to tell a room full of people who operate at the same level as me exactly what drives me enabled me to vocalise this. And really, really simply, I believe Attica's purpose, as I would hope many restaurants around the world have the same purpose, is that we want to make people's lives better. We want to improve things. And when I say people, I mean the staff that work in the restaurant, they're the most important. I mean the guests that come into the restaurant. I mean the suppliers that we work with. And I mean the greater community that the restaurant exists within. The way that we do this is by providing a superior dining experience five nights of the week. The way we do that, the specific details of the way that we run service, the specific details of the products that we purchase and make ourselves to provide that dining experience are what we consider the right thing to do. Today, the concept of being right is being attacked from many angles. For me, it's a little bit subjective, being right. One week, I have a guest come into the restaurant, sit down, have our tasting menu, matched wines, they stay for four and a half, five hours. They have an incredible time. Everything we say to them, they feel. They can really sense what it is that we want to do. And they say to me at the end of the night, that was an incredible dining experience. I really enjoyed that. I think that was one of the best meals that I've ever had. And I say to them, thank you so much. You don't know how much that moves me. I'm really glad that you enjoyed it. We want you to come back next week. <laughs> the following week, that guest does not come back, unfortunately. The following week, someone else comes in, and they have our tasting menu with matched wines. And they're there for four and a half hours. But four and a half hours is way too long for them. They didn't want to be there four and a half hours. And they're not really connecting with some of the things that we're saying. They say to me, oh, it feels a bit contrived, the stories that you're telling. It's a little bit cold in here. I didn't really like waiting 20 minutes for that last thing. You took me to your garden, and it seemed really lame. I don't want to go to your garden. <laughs> I've been to all these great restaurants around the world. I'm a foodie, and uh, I just, I'm just not really digging what you're doing. I think this is the worst restaurant in Melbourne. And I say, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't help but apologize that we didn't meet your expectations. I really want you to come back next week, <laughs> and hopefully we can do something about it. But you know what? They're both valid points of view. Who's to say which one is right? So for me today, being right is knowing within yourself what is the right thing to do. And that's going to drive your purpose. And in order to stick to that purpose, you need conviction. So my two, my two kind of highlight words today are purpose and conviction. I said that Attica's purpose is to improve people's lives. Now, improve things. And part of that is improving people's lives. And part of that, I think, well, I believe, is 
that what we offer is something unique. And that's really important to me, not because we need to be unique, because every restaurant needs to be different and you know, we need to differentiate ourselves from our, you know, the other restaurants in Melbourne, not just for its own sake, but because I believe that the dining experience that we offer as a restaurant is an extension of ourselves. This is, uh, this is our soul on show for people to come and appreciate. And if we're not different to the restaurant down the road, then what the hell are we? It's a, a strange kind of idea for me to consider a restaurant as being a great restaurant if the ideas and the actions are not original. So once we've got this in our hearts that what we need to do is something special, we need to perfect that and we need to push it, and we need to make it better and better and better. Within service, there are what are some things that I reckon are non-negotiables, and they're warmth and humor and honesty and kindness. They're the kind of the general ideas. There are some specifics within service. Each time that me or someone on my team goes to the table, we need to make eye contact with the person that you're talking to. You need to be alert to the tone of conversation on the table. You need to feel exactly where that person is at. Uh, at any stage of their dining experience. And I'm really lucky that I work in such a small restaurant where we're able to do that on a nightly basis with every single guest. Those non-negotiables, once they're perfected, once the team feels like that they can nail those every single night of the week for every single table, then we can start to work on our voice, our soul, our point of difference from any other restaurant. Once we've found that, once we we have it and we present it, we need to polish it. We polish it until it gleams. And then we polish a little bit further until it shines. And then we polish it even further until it glows. For me, something that shines, there are plenty of restaurants around the world that shine, but some of these reflect the light of others. Something that glows has its own light and expresses that from within. And that, for me, is almost the essence of greatness. If we don't do this, then it's a hollow action. It's a, a mimicry, a facsimile. It's not, it's not something honest. It's not something true. Being right, for me, is also being true. And in order to carry this out, you need to have conviction. My, uh, my mother is a trained chef, and she, uh, she owned two restaurants in my lifetime. And she would sometimes say to me, she moved from the kitchen to the front of the house in, in their second restaurant. and. Um, she would say to me sometimes, you can't please all of the people all of the time. I think some of you feel me on that. But um, I feel these days that I would really like to please all of the people all of the time. But unfortunately, there are times when every restaurant experience is not for everyone. And within this is the concept of, is the business right or is the guest right? And you need to, I think, understand that both things are possible. I've talked about non-negotiables, and I've talked about having your, your soul or your essence on display in service, and I think that's really, really important. But within that, the finer details can be, can be a little bit flexible. Um, there's a, a, just a small example. A guest comes into the restaurant uh, and sits down at the table of four. They're waiting for their other, other friends to arrive. I say, can I get you something to drink while you're waiting? And they say, yeah, what I'd really like is Smirnoff vodka and orange juice. And I say, ah, this is going to be a tough one. Because, and not out of any sense of us being a more special restaurant than any other, but we don't stock that brand of vodka. We only stock Australian vodkas because we believe in, in showing the, the spirit of Australia and what the Australian distillation industry is up to these days. And if that's not exactly what that person wants, then already we've got a little, a little bit of tension. But that's OK, because we can work around that. Most of you in the room, I'm assuming, are restaurant professionals. And there's ways of communication and of talking uh, that you can operate within that moment of tension to still find something quite beautiful. That's an example of being flexible. And I think there's many, there's many moments in, in a restaurant service where you need to be flexible. But you need to stick to your core beliefs. You need to stick to your core values. Those things are completely non-negotiable. They're your soul, like I said. That's an extension of who you are. And if you move away from that, then you're not doing anything right. You need to, you need to be firm with your purpose. Um, 
this conviction, this desire to, to stay true, I mentioned before, I think it's really the, it, it can be the genesis of greatness. I don't believe yet that Attica is a great restaurant. I think we're a really good restaurant and we're very bloody minded in our attempts to improve. This is a, a fairly common, I'm, I'm going to give a, another little example, and I think it's a fairly common thing that happened around the world, but when, when we did it, it was kind of new for Australia, and it was new for Melbourne, and, and whatever, and um, we, were, we were looking at the water that we served in the restaurant, and uh, we, we decided that it was a little bit silly to be purchasing water from Italy and shipping it halfway around the world and serving it in our restaurant in Australia, and that didn't make sense on a number of levels. So we decided to move to a, a local uh, mineral water. So we tasted through some of these local mineral waters and we weren't really impressed and we decided that maybe um, it didn't make sense to be purchasing mineral water full stop. So maybe we should buy uh, a machine that filtered and carbonated the water. So we started looking around for those machines and you know what, we didn't find one that was made in Australia because that was important to us as well. So we kept looking, kept looking, kept looking until we find this guy who was a, a water hygiene and plumbing specialist who had also had the same kind of idea to manufacture one of these machines within Australia. So we got talking to him and it took you know, six or seven months, but we finally had this unit in the restaurant with a three-stage filtration system and carbonation where we could uh, have our own water. And then we were trying to work out how to serve it and we had these jugs and these kind of really ugly purchased glass bottles and none of these made any sense. And at the time we were serving uh, sake as one of the matching beverages for our tasting menu, and the bottles that we were serving the sake from are these big 1.8 litre bottles called ishobin, it's a, the Japanese word for a, basically a magnum, and they were really this beautiful cobalt blue, and I thought, well, is there some way that we can reuse those bottles? So we had these bottles sent to uh, first an industrial designer and then a glass blower in Melbourne, and they refashioned these bottles and they sandblasted them so they wouldn't slip out of your hand when they became cold, they chopped the tops off them, and all of a sudden we had these really beautiful bottles. So now we had water that was kind of made by us and bottles that were made by us and we were content that that was something nice to serve in the restaurant. And at that time, this wasn't really common in Australia. We ran into all these obstacles, you know, people saying, no, but I don't like the flavour of your filtered carbonated water and I want this brand of water and I want that and la la la. And we just had to stick to our guns, you know. We had to be firm in our conviction that this was the right thing to do. We had this idea that we wanted to serve something Australian. We didn't want to ship it around the world. We, we disagreed with that process on a lot of levels, and we had to be firm. So we stuck to it, and that for me was a really important thing in, in saying, no, this is what we believe in, and we're going we're gonna to keep on doing that. I mentioned before about uh, improving, improving lives, and one of the sort of the most important things for us as a small team at Attica is, is to make sure that everyone in the team is, I guess, on board with everything that we're doing, that they, that they believe in it as well. Um, so when I was asked to, to come and give this talk, um, I thought I'd get everyone uh, in the restaurant involved. And we do this, this really lovely thing every day at, at 3 o'clock. Like I said, there's only 11 people uh, in the front of house team these days. Um, there's about 16 in the kitchen, though. Every day at 3 o'clock, we sit down as a group, and one person is called upon to present an idea, and we get to brainstorm a little bit. It takes about half an hour, and it's a really good kind of forum for us to, to bounce ideas around. Um, so I managed to swap, swap days with someone, and I got to basically present this idea to everyone at the restaurant. And I, um, I printed off these little bits of paper, and I wrote on the piece of paper, consider the concept of being right. How important is this to you, and why? in your daily work. And I gave one to everyone in the circle and I asked them just to fill in a couple of lines about it. So uh, I thought I'd just share a couple of them with you because the team the team's really important. It's all well and good to hypothesize and to vocalize these ideas, but unless everyone in your team is part of it, then it's not really going to go anywhere. Um, so consider the concept of being right. How important is this to you and why in your daily work? It's really important for us to grow and improve. We have to find the right way to do all the work, all the work. If we are not being right, our work will not succeed. I don't have to be right, but I want to do right. The right thing for Ben, for Attica, for Banjo, for our guests, and for my co-workers. Being right to me means there's no room to learn. Hmm. Being morally good or correct. It's important because my job requires me to pay attention to detail and to follow the standards that the team requires. 
doing the right thing over being right. There's no one way slash right slash correct way to do things. Ultimately, the outcome, the right outcome, is the priority. It's pretty important, but I'm working on being wrong and not taking it too personally. <laughs> That's my favorite. Uh, I've been in New York for nearly 48 hours now, and I've been hanging out with a lot of the other people who have been giving these talks, uh, and I've been asked a bunch of times, what are you going to talk about? And you know, we're having this conversation, there's 10 other people in the room that everyone wants to talk to, and I kind of feel like I've only got about 90 seconds to say what I'm talking about. And I couldn't condense it into this one idea of what I'm talking about. And I realized that was kind of silly, because it's really important to have an understanding of what you're talking about. And it's that kind of knowing on a subconscious level, but not being able to vocalize it. So I kind of put it all together. And what I realized is that for me, being right is knowing deep inside yourself that what you're doing is right, discovering that sense of inner purpose, and having the conviction to stand firm and see that purpose through. Thanks. <laughs>